So welcome to the Mile High Podcast. I am Woo! grateful for you to be joining us. And remember, you can listen to this on YouTube, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Libsyn, on Facebook. It is everywhere. And, uh, and, and on our blog. And we hope to have you join us August 18th to 21st in the Mile High City at Mile High 4, which is looking to be outstanding, the best one yet, especially because we're going to have none other than Joe Borio return. Awesome. And I'm so grateful to have you back, and I'm so grateful to be on here with you right now. Yeah, it's an honor to be here, as always. As always. Know that. And uh, so a little bit about you for people that don't know you. Um, Joe Borio is from Syracuse, New York. His uh, father opened a large Italian restaurant, worked hard, and Joe learned about hard, hard work in that restaurant. He played every sport he, you can imagine in, in high school and college. He, he practices in Cicero, New York since 1991, which is one of the things I love about him because there's a lot of people that mentor chiropractors but don't necessarily practice. Um, but he, He's, you know, hands-on, practicing, you know, open, and seeing large, one of the largest practices in the country, thousands of people a year, and he's also committed to teaching teams so they can reach their individual highest level of service so they can impact and help more lives. And, and one of the things I always pick up about Dr. Joe when I'm around him is his passion is, is, not do, is doing things for the most important reason why we're chiropractors, which is the people that we serve and the people whose lives need to be touched by chiropractic and the power of an adjustment. And I know you're going to you know, really learn a lot from him today as well as when you see him out in Colorado. So uh, uh, glad you're here, Joe. Honored to be here. Thank you. Uh, now, you're known for saying, and I've heard this from you before, that the future of chiropractic is, is in our hands, um, and it's a huge responsibility. Why do you say that? No one does what we do, ever. Um, think about the world if you didn't have dentists, you know, and, and I always say if you're the first chiropractor, like if you were the first dentist, you know, so all of a sudden you come up with this new way to look at the body and evaluate its health, um, so now here you are, you're, you're the first chiropractor. You're somebody, you're the only person who, who looks at, even though science has proven it for decades and common sense has pro proven it for, you know, a thousand years, right, that you're taking care of the brain and the nervous system and the spinal cord, the communication that brings life to the body and health and healing to the body. So the bottom line is you're the only person who does it, and the future of chiropractic is in our hands, meaning that are you practicing chiropractic, and I don't stand here to judge anyone, is chiropractic center stage. Are you practicing chiropractic? Even if you're doing other things in your office, are you practicing the philosophy, art, and science, and business, if you will, of chiropractic? Because it is in your hands, literally. And if you're not, you're li you are making a, a more confusion and diluting what chiropractic is there Therefore, you're working against the, the future of chiropractic rather than the um, for the future of chiropractic. So I love how you said that, that comment about chiropractic being center stage. And there's so few places, whether they be events or education, uh, chiropractic schools, um, offices, where chiropractic is center stage. And, and that's so important. Um, I, I'm grateful you said that, said that that way. Yes, I, I don't think that, um, I, I think the big problem, Dan, is that most chiropractors, when they come out of school, aren't really taught what chiropractic is. I also think chiropractic's intangible. How do you explain love? You know, um, not to say there's not science, obviously chiropractic is very scientific, but, you know, how do you explain innate intelligence? How do you explain universal intelligence? Even though you can see it, how can you word it in a way that makes sense to people? And um, so I think a lot of chiropractors, it's easy to talk about nutrition because it's tangible. You know, it's easy to talk about exercise. It's tangible. But all of a sudden you start talking about chiropractic and it's in a, in a more of a purist sense. And people really struggle with how to explain it. So and, and because of that, you, you, you feel uncomfortable. You feel lack of confidence or certainty. So then what happens is you gravitate towards 
how much vitamin C should you take? And people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and so forth. And, again, that doesn't mean there's no merit there. But because, you know, so all of a sudden you're going to fill an event with um, supplements and nutrition and exercise. Again, they all have merit. But that's not what chiropractic is. So think about a whole bunch of people that are really in great shape but don't brush their teeth. You know, <laughs> that's the way it is. You got a whole bunch of people that are eating great, right, and they're exercising, but they got a sick, disease, rotting flesh in their body because the nervous system's not talking to it. And if you don't believe that's true, take a piece of meat out of your refrigerator that doesn't have a nervous system to it and throw it outside in the yard, and it's going to start to rot and stink. And that's what essentially happens to your organs inside on a slow basis because it doesn't have good nerve supply. So, Hey, I got to say something because I know you know a lot of chiropractic history. Do you remember or know of Dr. DiGiacomo? I know that name. Yeah, yeah. he was a philosophy teacher at, at Columbia and then at NYCC back in the day. Okay. He, I, the first chiropractic lay lecture I ever heard, my mom was in chiropractic school and I was like attending an orientation and he did a lay lecture for like, uh, for the families and he had a piece of steak and he, <laughs> and he cut it. I love and, it. Yeah, yeah, and he was like, this is the difference between you and this doesn't heal. Exactly. <laughs> and I still remember that because the first thing I heard of chiropractic was that. And I remember telling people, oh, there's a steak and you cut it. And I thought it was the coolest thing. You know, one of my uh, one of my favorite analogies, I always, you know, as time changes or goes by, things change. But I love the 3D printer analogy. I just think that is that is so beautiful because your, your brain is organizing your body to take a molecule of something and put it in a specific area and then after it totally manifests an organ you know it brings life and organizes it and you know we look at that and that makes sense to us why you can build a cup out of a 3d printer but essentially that's what your brain's doing it's it's, right. it's manifesting something in a three-dimensional you know out of inner inner material and then once it's you know breathes in life into it it, it makes it alive so it's another way to think about it, you know, trying to speak in terms that people understand. So, Yeah. Now, with that, tell me, because I don't know this, and it's always a great thing to hear, is like, what was your introduction to chiropractic? How, what was your introduction to chiropractic um, it, for you? And then how did you find out, you know, how did you end up deciding to go to chiropractic school? Yeah. Uh, I was about, I think it was about 30 minutes into my birth where I was, my head was hanging out of my mother's uh, womb, I guess we can word it that way, and uh, forceps were being used on uh, on me. I got hung up or, you know, whatever, however you want to call it, and uh, so it caused a lot of trauma, not known at the time, but I had all kinds of uh, neurologic problems. Uh, um, I had seizures. Uh, I had migraines. I had trouble hearing, seeing, chronically ill. It was getting progressively more frequent. My parents struggled, went to many different medical experts with no, uh, with no luck. I had CT scans. You know, back then, they didn't have an MRI. And uh, my mother, through the insistence of a neighbor, uh, her name was uh, Nye, Mrs. Nye, she, they brought me to a chiropractor, Dr. William Fazer in North Syracuse. He started adjusting me. I mean, to, to condense the story here quickly for the sake of time and uh it it resolved my problems you know mm -hmm. and it was funny because my mother still tells the story sometimes that you know one of the first questions he asked is tell me about your son's birth you know so right uh, and she was amazed because i was four, four years into my life before i even you know went to the chiropractor so um so from that point forward i had always gone to a chiropractor never thought about being a chiropractor always comes down to a, a love story or a girl but i was dating a girl in high school and her <laughs> And my dad was an orthopedic specialist along with, and so I started hanging out with all these people and I was like, wow, these guys are great and, you know, they do well and they're in great shape and I was into working out and playing sports and this is what I want to do. I want to, I'm going to be an orthopedic and I started a pre-med program. I got accepted to Rush Medical, Buffalo State and, or Buffalo uh, University and uh, Upstate Medical and uh, I was on route. I had to do a rotation in uh, Strong Memorial Hospital. Uh, I went to undergraduate at Brockport, and I came home crying that weekend, and my mother said, what's up? And I go, I don't want to be a medical doctor. And she said, why? And I know it sounds funny, and I say this a lot when I lecture, but I said, everybody's sick. You know? <laughs> like, I was like, wow, I'm around a bunch of sick people. Like, I didn't ever, I never really thought about it, as stupid as that is. I, I never thought the fact that I'd be around a bunch of sick people. Right, so right. Um, 
I went and talked to Dr. Thasier, who was my chiropractor still to that day. And, you know, my mother probably knew. My dad did. My dad was more upset because he had paid all this money for me to get, you know, my application fees. And, uh, and then I decided to be a, a chiropractor. So I went to National College of Chiropractic. And, uh, you know, I remember Dr. Kent said, you know, a lot of people go into chiropractic school more of a chiropractor than they when they came out. So, so you know, National has great intentions. You know, I hear a lot of bad things being said. I mean, they, they have – Dr. Jim Winterstein, I mean, he's a really – He's a really great guy. He's a good person, good human being. The school, you know, is a is a great educational institution that holds itself up high, but it doesn't it's not a chiropractic school. I mean, it doesn't teach chiropractic and it doesn't teach you philosophy and doesn't teach you the nervous system and it's a very allopathic mechanistic training. So I came out of there and um uh, I was very confused. I struggled for a couple of years in practice, and uh, it wasn't until I went to a consultant myself, which uh, uh, was Coslow, uh, Brian Coslow Management, and uh, he was a wonderful guy. He brought in these wonderful speakers. I met Bill Esteb, uh, which I always like to tell Bill when I see him because that was a long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, but I met Reggie Gold, and Reggie Gold uh, really opened my eyes like Dr. Thaser did, you know, 25 years earlier. And then uh, I had uh, become a Reggie groupie, went down to Sherman, listened to Reggie up in Cal in Toronto, California. Um, I I'll tell you this quick, Danny. There, I remember sitting in Toronto, Canada. Now I get the value of it, but then I, I probably didn't think of it the way I think of it now. There were nine people in a room for a whole day with Reggie. So he put on an event. And there was only nine people in there. I remember counting. And I remember thinking, like, wow, like, where is, like, man, this guy's, like, pretty awesome. Like, why aren't this, why isn't this room filled? Now I'm thinking, oh, my God, like, what will you give to go back and listen to Reggie in a room, you know, with nine people? And just, you know, it was just, it was incredible. I mean, he was, he was wonderful. So, um, little, so that was probably my, that was my big, my, my big turning point. That's really what turned it around for me. Let on his commitment that there was only nine people. And he was probably, like, if I just... To affect one life here, you know, because that's well, the kind of person he was, right? I sat in rooms with him where there was hundreds of people. There was no it's, difference, look, just like you're saying. I mean, whether it was nine, I'm sure he might have walked in and said, shit, there's only nine people here. <laughs> well, you know, I got to do my best. But he did. You know, right. it was wonderful. So, And now that's an important thing because I'm very into chiropractic philosophy. I know you are. Some people will say it's not practical. That's just philosophy. What difference does that make? That kind of That kind of stuff. What difference does having a solid grasp of chiropractic philosophical perspective make in a practice? It makes it makes all the difference. Philosophy is is the love. I mean, in Latin, it's as you know. I'm not telling you something you don't know, right. but it's love of knowledge. So, so the everything that you see scientifically manifest through philosophy. So I don't care if you're talking electronics, I don't care if you're talking chemistry and physics and you know astronomy, anything is all going to start from, so philosophy is gonna give you the why that you're doing something. So right. if we understand that life is created and comes from uh, certainly the, you know, in the body through an intelligence, you know, you're going to then look for the, you know, through the philosophy, you're going to look for ways to improve that and ways to prove it. So BJ spent his entire life sci with scientific methods to prove innate, prove universal, prove the, what we do has a physical logic benefit measure you know that was measurable and tangible a lot of people forget that you know I had medical doctors that came in and measured their physiology I went I did a three-day sabbatical uh, self-motivated in Palmer mm -hmm. uh, just, just and went in the reference li library you know to hold books that he wrote and to read his notes and such to me was was very meaningful to me so and you get to see the level of commitment that you know people had like a Clarence Gonstead there you know I mean there's so many chiropractors like I don't care, you know, now I think, and I, and I'm, and I, I certainly take responsibility for that myself because that was my mindset. I was always about wanting to be Reggie, wanting to be Jim Sigafoos, wanting to be in Grossman. So I always said, hey, if I could see a ton of people in a day, then I would be a great chiropractor, you know. So that's, that was how I measured chiropractic value. Um, and there's, there's value to it, but it's not everything. But you start to read about these other guys that, you know, you're just like, man, they we are we are nothing right. nothing compared to the amount of time effort dedication sacrifice that they put in towards 
what we do as chiropractors. So, um, you know, so philosophy is everything to me. It, it, it makes the entire, it makes every day different to me when I walk into the office. I read philosophy every morning before I start to practice. So. Wow. And, and we enjoy the benefit of what, what all those people work for. We, we have nothing to, to deal with compared to what they deal with. I mean, yeah. I will say, well, there's hardships around chiropractic. Compared to then, we've got it cakewalk. Now, can you imagine if freaking BJ Palmer had YouTube and Facebook and, <laughs> are you serious? and Reddit? Like, are you serious? Like, I've seen posters that he was on the radio at 2 a.m., you know, because right. <laughs> right. it was just it, it was just obviously a mission. Now, I'm sure you've seen that, that where people in, in all your years and in, in consulting or, or and just colleagues where they get just a touch of the philosophy that they didn't have before and they just take off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, again, that y there's a why. You know, if you, what's the fun in the mechanistic part of life? You know, what's the, well, there, there's a great analogy that I heard years ago, and it was like, if I take a, if I take your car apart, and I'm a good mechanic, and I put it back together, it's going to start. But if I take, you know, your dog apart, or you apart, mm -hmm. and I'm a great surgeon with the greatest technology, and I put you back exactly the way you are, you're not going to start. Right. Yet everything was there. You know, I, I use the example in I lecture. If I took a cyanide tablet, which I think some people out there may wish I would, but if I took a cyanide tablet and I'm dead, 10 seconds later, I'm dead as a, as a doorknob, right? I mean, everything that mechanically was in me 10 seconds later is still there. Neuropeptides and neurotransmitters, my heart, you know, mechanically everything's there, but obviously something left my body. So, you know, that's what you get to work with, that intangible uh, substance that's there, that we know is there, intuit intuitive, deductive, inductive reasoning tells us it's there. Um, so that's what we get to work with. And so everybody knows it's there. Everyone that walks in your office knows chiropractic. I mean, we just go, you know, we, we do a 30-second drill, things you've heard me lecture on many times. But, you know, people know what tells your body what to do and how does it communicate. You just ask them questions, and then they derive to the answer because they already know it. And then all you need to do is go back to that on a regular basis, and they get it. They don't need to know innate intelligence. They don't need to know chiropractic philosophy. That's for us. You're not trying to make mom or dad the chiropractor. Um, but, you know, to, to expose them to that and to nurture that that idea done consistently people stay with you for a long time so yep yep totally now mention philosophy you mentioned reading it every morning and, and what are some resources today what are resources that you like to point people to or whether they're books from a long time ago or they're new ones sure for chiropractic philosophy what what are the things you tell people like the top one two or three things to grab sure the the first book that i would tell anyone to read is uh and, and bob Sinek came out with a you know a more a modern version of it, uh, but is the chiropractic textbook written by Stevenson, um, because that is the that is the book of chiropractic philosophy, and you know it talks about the theoretical placement of innate intelligence within the body. You know where does that reside within the brain? You know innate's all over the body. Like where is it? What is it? Where does it come from? Um, and then it talks about the practical location of it. And then he talks about how an innate would work and communicate. It really breaks it down in ways that make you think and it asks you questions just like you would take a course. So that would be the first book I would read. The second book I would read is Fred Barge's Life Without Fear. I think chiropractors are filled with fear. And I don't mean fear, and I don't mean to insult any chiropractor when I say that, but there's a lack of confidence when I say fear. You, you tremble at saying something, uh, you're, you're afraid of being rejected and, and so forth. So we tend to not act rather than act. Um, and uh, so that's a phenomenal book. I love Giant vs. Pygmy, another Fred Barge pamphlet version book uh, for Palmer. Um, that really helps. And then I like to go outside. I like to read uh, Napoleon Hill. In fact, uh, I, I didn't know you were going to ask me these questions, right, until about <laughs> 10 minutes before the call. But, you know, so I, I've got Napoleon Hill. I brought that down with me. You asked me my, uh, you know, and then I, I, have, I have any given time, I have two to three journals. So I write down, if I read something in a, a journal, in a book, I write it down. And then I have my formal journal, which I rewrite it in the formal journal. And so it's more organized. So it's not, you know, sporadic thoughts. Right. And, um, and then I read those over. You know, every morning I read over my, uh, you know, I've got my goals and, you know, my, my, uh, I write, rewrite those every couple of weeks. I read them over every single day. 
Um, you know, so I spend 30 minutes adjusting my, you know, I always say the best adjustment you can give anyone is above the Atlas. So I adjust myself above the Atlas, you know, every day. I mean, every day for, you know, I'd say 30 minutes, uh, maybe more. I'm listening to somebody that's awesome and I'm reading something and I, I just get my head mentally prepared for the day at hand because the, the days some life can be tough. You just want to be ready. So now this is, I was, I was going to ask you this question. So I'm, I'm glad we're touching on it now because I want people that are listening to understand this because there's a lot of people that will be listening to this that they're new grads or they're in school or they're starting out in practice or they're struggling in practice. And they'll, they'll have lots of uh, lack mentality or, or various things along those lines. And now here you are, you're a person who has achieved a certain level of success within chiropractic, so, you know, a great number, seeing a great number of people, has, seen, has had very high volume practice, one of the biggest in, you know, in the profession. Um, and, and, and consult people, and you just said you're still doing all of this, right? And there's people that you ask them to do this, yes. and they're, only, they're not even doing it, right? You know, they're like, oh, that's not gonna work. And here you are Correct. having achieved a certain thing, and you're still making sure you make that time for yourself. So rituals, I personally think, are very important. What are some key rituals that, that, that are important for you? What, what are your rituals? I mean, you mentioned a couple of them just now, but is there anything else to build on? Yeah, well, I, I think um, a couple other things. One, I mean, I would you gotta you have to make your mind and thought of clarity. And again, not my words, but you know, I'm, I'm boreoism. I usually take <laughs> you know, I synergize other ideas and I put them you know in my own viewpoint. So I don't want to take credit for every word I say here, but um, you got to make your inner voice so powerful that anything from the outside is is not going to penetrate it. You know, you got to make the walls of your ship so high that the waves can't bring water in your ship because that's what'll sink it. And I'm not saying it's easy. And, you know, I think sometimes people think, you know, there's so many wonderful chiropractors. I mean, you listen to people, like I said, like Reggie, who you can still listen to and Freddie Barge, and you can listen to great people now. You know, I mean, Chris Zeno has got a huge practice, high volume, sees huge number of people, Bob Schiffman, you know, guys that are really seeing a lot of stuff. There's a lot of great consulting programs out there other than ours, you know, Amped is doing some really great things and such. And uh, so, you know, you get out there and you look at all that and, and, you know, what are they doing? They are they are constantly training. I mean, I think the idea that you're not you're not working with somebody like my dad told me I struggled my first two years in practice really bad, Dan. So I mean, I was doing really bad. So my dad said to me, Joe, why don't you get some help? And it was out of pride. It wasn't ego where I thought I knew more. It was out of pride where I said, I'll figure this out in some way. <laughs> some sense of accomplishment right. and my dad said the most beautiful thing to me you know in similar way he said joe you didn't become a chiropractor on your own like you didn't learn chiropractic on your own you relied on other people that knew a lot why don't you go rely on somebody who knows how to run a practice well mm -hmm. and that's it was really that conversation that you know opened my eyes to go to see a consultant so the idea that why would you waste your potential of 10 years or 20 years to figure it out when there's already somebody doing it really well right. or somebody did it really well. Why wouldn't you? So, so my point is training is important. I, so getting to your question, you know, my morning ritual is training. I'm in physical, you know, decent shape. So I go to the gym every morning. I get up at 455 and I go to, I say every morning four to five days a week, I go to the gym, I'm at the gym by 5.20, 5.30, and I work out for an hour, uh, then I'm, I listen to some philosophy, somebody in or outside of chiropractic to prepare my mind, I get to the office an hour early, I get my head ready to get in a great place, reading philosophy and science and so forth, the most recent article on chiropractic, whatever, and then I'm ready for the day. Um, I would say that's important. The other point is don't surround yourself with people that, you know, surround yourself with people that are going to pull you, not not people you feel comfortable with. If you're around a bunch of people they feel comfortable with, you wow, you know, you're you're in a, you're really in a state of, of being comfortable, and then that, that's complacency, so you're not going to grow. You want to be around people where you're like, holy, you know, mackerel, that's like, holy, I didn't even think that was, I didn't even think that was possible. Like, right. how the hell are you doing that? You know, mm -hmm. those are the people you want to be around. And, and I don't just mean, you know, when it's chiropractic, I mean, it can be spiritual relationship wise uh, financially whatever those are the people you want to surround yourself. so those are the rituals you know be around those people and uh, and and consistently I think a lot of people say like you know they go to the gym I'm 300 pounds overweight it's like well I worked my ass off 
for two weeks. Like I don't even notice anything. You know, you can't be in a place in your life that's taken you 30 or 40 years to get there and expect I'm going to try really hard for a month and things are going to change. I mean, it ain't going to happen. It's going to take months and months and years and years, but eventually done consistently, just like chiropractic, a positive thing will always come out. So Right. Now, and since we've talked about mentors, who have been, and you had mentors, I mean, obviously as an athlete, you had to have mentors, right? Uh, and coaches, um, and I'm sure you've had mentors in and out of chiropractic. Who have been some of the most powerful mentors for you outside of chiropractic, um, as well as within? Sure. Yeah, within chiropractic, uh, Reggie Gold certainly was um, a huge influence to me. Bob Schiffman, to this day, uh, you know, I talk to him periodically. Um, I have so much, you know, respect and love and admiration for that man. Um, and um, uh, C.J. Mertz was huge. I was a member, uh, probably one of, the, at the time, one of the best, um, I think, consulting programs there ever was uh, in chiropractic. You know, chiropractic, we're, we're trying to, you know, obviously get there um, to that level. I think, at, you know, in his day with that system that no longer exists now, but uh, he was he was great. Uh, Fred uh, Schofield, uh, I was a member of Fred Schofield for three years as well. Um, you know, the the passion, the the fortitude, the resolute, mentality that he gave you the, the rhino I thought that was that was just outstanding and then obviously DD you know I read DD and you know people say well they're not around well you can listen to DD or BJ Palmer there's right. recordings of them. I read them every day I read DD Palmer I read Fred Barge uh, Sid Williams was a huge I used to go to DE for years um, so really did very very well with that outside of chiropractic uh, I would say the the biggest influence I quote them constantly is my dad. My dad, uh, thank God, still with me. Um, one of the best human beings, business people, successful people, pragmatic, practical, real, authentic. You know, my mom as well. I'm just, my dad had just a huge influence. And then, like you said, a lot of my coaches that I had, I mean, I played high school, I played college, I played at the professional level. Uh, and, um, and it was, um, you know, th those are great. Those are great times. And I learned a lot from that, you know, uh, one of the things just to touch on uh, quickly was uh, one of the, I think the benefits you have as a chiropractor, you know, as a business person, um, that people don't have if they didn't play sports is you, you, it's really easy to understand that you're going to fail at something um quickly mm -hmm. in order to learn so you know with sports if somebody says hey this is the play you're going to run or this is how you're going to throw a right hand or you know this is our press or this is our clear no one starts in sports playing your whole life thinking okay the first time the coach says this i'm going to get it you realize you're going to kind of suck at it for a while and then you're going to practice it to get good so so having those moments where you're not competent highly competent at something it becomes very normal for, I think, somebody who's playing sports. So when I, when you do something in your practice, you know, I never would start something different and think, well, I'm going to be really good at it. I would think, wow, it's going to take me a while. I didn't mind not being good at something for a while until I learned how to get good at it. I think a lot of people are, are uncomfortable with that. They, you know, they're really uncomfortable with the idea that, wow, I'm going to try something new. I like what you do, Dr. Joe. I'm going to try that. I tried it three times. Man, it really went bad. I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to go back to what I was doing before. But what you went back to doing before wasn't giving you any level of success, you know, but that's where you got comfortable. So, right. so I, I think that's what the advantage you get out of playing sports. So for yeah, me anyway. Yeah. Now, uh, since you mentioned your dad, you, this is something I see. I see a lot of chiropractors struggle with it, and, and everybody would admit they probably struggle with it at different points, which is that if you're doing a lot and you're putting into the practice also being a good parent, being a good dad, being, being, ha having that family uh, not take a back seat, you know, and so if you've got a rocking practice, practice like you do, plus consulting, and I know you're a phenomenal dad, uh, you have great boys, how, what are some things to help people do that better? Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. I can tell you straight out that in order for me at the time and my understanding and skill set to have the level of practice that I did, I wasn't always the great dad. I wasn't always, you know, the great uh, spouse. I wasn't always the great friend um, because you become so, you know, 
and maybe narcissistic is the right word, but it wasn't, it's narcissistic implies that maybe it's all for self, you know, gratification, if you will. It wasn't really for that, but I was so stuck like an Olympian on trying to see all these people and then sustain that, you know, things, there's, there's less balance um, that occurs. So one of the things that you learn, and I've learned uh, certainly, and I, and I always share that, you know, one of the, I think, great things of any mentor is you're teaching some of the mistakes you made yourself. Right, right. And, you know, I've made many of them. So, um, you know, you want that balance in your life. So one of the things we teach our clients now is we do a three-day adjusting week. I'm sorry, Dan. That's right. So we do a three-day adjusting week. So we do a Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and that was huge for me. That was probably one of the best things I ever did in my life was I just Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Tuesday, I work a half a day on the practice. Mm -hmm. And then usually one day every couple of weekends, I would do something for the practice. But outside of that, I had more, you know, now I got two days a week, I can make breakfast for my kids to go to school. I can take them to school. I can spend time with them. Um, I can have a, a much healthier relationship. I can take some travel. I can have some me time, have some hobbies, things I like to do. Ha, you know, go to my kids' games. I mean, I was, you know, I was, go, I was going five days a week, some days, six days a week in the practice, and sometimes seven days a week because I do a three-day screening or whatever, you know, and outside talks and such. So all of a sudden, you know, it's nonstop where now I realize that three-day week was really the best thing I ever did. It gave me great time to be in the office. It gave me time to be with myself and my family, people I love. And then it gave me, by Monday, I was eager, eager to get back in the office again. So. Right, right. So um, uh, a couple of questions before we wrap up I want to ask you. Um, we've, sure. mentioned some we've mentioned some chiropractic books. What are some favorite books that you'd recommend people to, to read, whether it be chiropractic or non-chiropractic, you know, uh, for their own growth. Like you had the Napoleon Hill one, right? Yes. Uh, anything written by, absolutely. Napoleon Hill, I mean, I, I think I've read it. You know, he's got a great one. It's called Outwitting the Devil. It's not a religious book. In fact, they, they didn't release that because of, uh, in his day, because they thought it had religious connotations, which it doesn't. But the devil is, is the fear, the self-destructive thought of fear. I think that's an absolutely must read for any human being, especially chiropractors that have to push through that negative, destructive thought. Um, um, so I think that, you know, that's obviously uh, the, probably the, the most important. So he wrote another book called The Law of Success, a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal book. Uh, and then I read James Allen. You know, as a man, which is just absolutely powerful book. And then there's all the new ones, you know, Tipping Point, 10X. And, you know, I love to read stories of other people, uh, you know, like the Steve Jobs, obviously. You know, I think a lot of times people look at somebody's level of success wherever they are, whether, and I don't mean success money wise, I mean, that's easy to measure. Um, but um, success by meaning having an impact, right? Like Gandhi didn't have a lot of money, but he had a huge impact, right? right. And Mother Teresa and, and and uh, Abraham Lincoln and such. So I like to read their stories because you realize that, man, you know, Abraham Lincoln had a really tough life, you know, and, and Gandhi really struggled and Steve Jobs, you know, really struggled and Bill Gates had a lot of trouble and Microsoft almost went under several times and then he had all kinds of troubles with the feds later on and Monopoly and stuff, you know. So I think when you read their stories, you know, you realize that, look, it's, you know, there's a certain amount of core resolution that you you need and that by following those rituals they get you through a lot of those challenges so wow and and that's important because sometimes you think of all oh, these people were just lucky right, just, right. you know they, they, I, I can't have their kind of fortune or you know uh, i don't mean fortune money but their kind of luck yeah. or whatever right so when you asked me on one of those questions what my favorite quote is that it changes over the years you know you, you kind of like one of the best things I read and it was by Jim Rohn and it said don't wish for things to be easier wish to be better yeah. and I'll tell you that is you know that has probably been the most um, powerful quote that I could not only absorb myself but to share with other people again that's not my quote but you know, wish to be better. Like when you look at life as a cruel taskmaster, in the words of Napoleon Hill. So when you look out there, you know, The Alchemist, another great book, by the way. But when you look out there, you, um, you know, if I'm not mastering something, then, you know, everyone has those challenges. To master it, you need to be better. Read, right. learn, uh, look within yourself, uh, make yourself 
yourself in better shape, make yourself mentally with stronger fortitude, what have you. And then when, as you get better, then uh, handling a conversation, let's say, Danny, you and your wife come in and I say, hey, you guys, you know, my staff says you missed your adjustment last time. And you say, well, geez, you know, my son had an ear infection, so we were in the pediatrician. So, but, you know, we're here to get adjusted and the child hasn't been checked. And, you know, I find most doctors, they want to say something, but they don't know what to say. Yeah. And they don't want to look foolish. So they, they revert to say nothing. Right. And what I teach people is if you say nothing, the result of having you and your wife bring your child in is zero. If you say something and you suck at it, even if you say it with a trembling voice and you're horrible, your likelihood is at least a little bit, if not a lot better than zero. So you're better at sucking and then evaluating that and then saying, how can I be better? Right. How can I be better? And you got to look at that at every day, take an inventory every day and just keep working on getting better. Cause, cause in the end it's progress. It's not things that make us happy. It's progress that makes right. us happy. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, how do people, if people want to get in touch with you, want to know more about you, how, how do they find you? Yeah, the, the easiest way to find me uh, as, a, as a, a potential client, somebody who's looking to train with us, is chiropassionconsulting.com. Uh, or if they, anybody can, I mean, all my clients have my cell number, so you can call me on my cell, which is 315-569-1404. And uh, one of the things that we do, Danny, I, which I think is really powerful, again, for those people that want to you know, grow their practice in our format. And, and that is, we, we, I still practice, so we have clients that are allowed to come in the office a couple times a year and, you know, watch what we do, train on what we do. I, I, I just think that that makes it really powerful. Um, you know, some docs charge a lot of money for that, you know, just as a one day thing, but, you know, that's included in our program and uh, along with webinars and all kinds of other great stuff that we do. So we're not you know, I wouldn't say that I'm the, the best consulting program for everyone. I don't fit everyone. But if you're looking to grow a lifetime practice, if you're looking to see a whole bunch of people make chiropractic center stage, have financial success, balance, and mastery in your life, man, I'll tell you, we can definitely take you there, no doubt. Excellent. Excellent. And, and um, I am so stoked that you're going to be out in Colorado again. Uh, yes. And there's a lot of people have been messaging me, oh, you're having Joe back. <laughs> <laughs> we love Joe. So so that's going to be, be... Well, That's nice to hear. Thank you. <laughs> so we're excited you're going to be there. Um, people, mark your calendars August 18th to 21st, um, www.milehighchiro.org. And remember, if you enjoy um, chiropractic and chiropractic philosophy and things about chiropractic, Tune in to us on iTunes, subscribe so you can check us out there, and you're going to get you know, great, great, great gems like, uh, like Dr. Joe just, just uh, shared with us. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be listening back to this and getting notes in <laughs> for stuff that I've got to remember to start doing again. You know, and that visit the office thing is so important. I did that years ago. We have a mutual friend, Dr. John Madeira. He was yeah. uh, my consultant for a long time, and yes. I visited office for a day. That just changed everything just by sitting in on his uh, – how he reviewed results and in his adjusting room because he was rocking at that time, and it changed everything. So being around people that are doing something, whether it be – you know, whatever you want to achieve, right. when you're around someone who's doing something maybe. better than you uh, that you want to do, that's, that's how you grow because they just rub off on you, and that's, that's why I like doing the events like we do. Yeah, the, unfortunately in chiropractic, if somebody's doing something bigger, maybe better is the wrong word, but bigger than you, we tend to condemn and tear them down. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> We've all been through a little bit of that or a lot of bit of that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but yeah. They, so. They've got to be doing something wrong if they're doing it better or bigger yes. or whatever. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yep. Versus maybe they're doing it with honesty, integrity, and authenticity, and they just have mastered something that you just don't know yet, right? <laughs> yes, yes. You know, the days of, uh, you know, one of the things that I love about, uh, you know, the idea of like a L Liam Schubold, you know, practicing, you know, in Peru, you know, the, the it, it's a different ball game now. You know, I practiced 25 years, you know, and, 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 you know, the amount of regulation now and compliance. I mean, you know, it, you know, used to be able to go in the office and, you know, keep a travel card and somebody would come in and you adjust them and they would leave and, you know, and, and it was simpler, you know, and, and, right. uh, you know, we have we have much different strains and stresses on us, and I've been through my own challenges, you know, than we used to have years ago. So right. we definitely, uh, you know, we want to do things 
better and we want to do it with that level of freedom. And the only way we're going to get back to some kind of level standard of freedom and sanity rather than insanity is we need to, you know, we need to work together. And, right. and you know, obviously, I, you know, we're on Sherman and we're in the IFCO and, you know, those are the places that we need to hang our hat. We need to, we need to start, you, and you've said this many times as you lecture, Danny, you, you know, we need to start supporting the institutions that support our vision. And um, that's huge. So. Well, and actually, let, let's just say that one more thing, because that's super important. Um, obviously, we were both involved with Sherman College. We're big fans of Sherman College because I feel it's, it's, the, it's today's fountainhead, right? Yes. Um, for chiropractic philosophy. It's training stellar chiropractors. Uh, we know that, and it's a place to, to send students, in, in, my, in my opinion, and yours opinion, your opinion, if that's the kind of chiropractor that you want to have. The IFCO is vital and this year um, funds from Mile High are going to the IFCO. Um, I want to see the IFCO expand. They're the only non-therapeutic subluxation centered international organization that our profession has, which is almost sad that that's the case, but we need them to thrive. Why do you think the IFCO is important? What, me? Yeah. Oh, the why? I'm sorry. I thought you were kind of like talking before. Like, <laughs> why do you? Uh, I have still does a few things. One, just like you said, it supports subluxation base. Two, it handles it politically. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna address political aspects, putting people on political boards and political systems. It it works like uh, B.J. Palmer taught us that you know we need to be we're a political organization as well. We forget that because politics is what gives us our rights as a chiropractor. Right. It works from the educational standpoint, so it affects our education as students and so forth. And it just it's a great collection of great chiropractors, great thinkers, leaders that are going to be able to articulate and that have had significant success in practice in practicing subluxation-based chiropractic. So it, it just brings a multitude of advantages to any chiropractor and, and to you know to be a member of chiro, uh, uh, IFCO is to be a, a member of the future of, of chiropractic, subluxation-based chiropractic. Absolutely, and, and I know Liam Schubel would agree, and we just simply don't have time to talk about Liam Schubel, so we will, we'll put that aside. <laughs> and, I'm um, going to have dinner with Shane Walker here tomorrow, too, so we're going to make sure we send a picture uh, of ourselves to Liam because it'll drive him crazy that he's not here with us. Well, so. there you go. That's, that's good. Yeah, um, <laughs> and uh, so, so thank you for taking your valuable time um, to join us on the Mile High Podcast. We look forward to seeing you in Colorado. Uh, Dr. Joe, and thank you for all that you do for chiropractic and chiropractors, and most importantly, the people that we all serve that really need the gift of what chiropractic brings to the public. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Danny. You're welcome. Like our page on Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Mile High Cairo.